Hello everyone, I'm Hugo. And I'm Jake. And welcome to Hugo and Jake. Today we're beginning our actual series yeah. on Jordan B. Movie Peterson's 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos. Yeah. It's, it's got a few notations in yours. Um, and that's just the first chapter and the introduction. So, um, again, if you are a Jordan uh, Peterson fan, if you've uh, seen the last two videos we did, uh, the first one discussing kind of how Peterson um, came to be in the public eye uh, over the uh, uh, C-13 bill, and subsequently we responded to comments on that video because, um, well, you kind of act like uh, when someone says something bad about Beyonce on Twitter. Yes. It's like that. It's he has his own beehive. Uh, Bayhive. No, that's a Bayhive. He's a Jordan B. Peterson. It's a Jordan Beehive Peterson. So, uh, anyway, this is uh, us doing the overture, uh, which is, in fact, just an introduction. I literally, in my copy, just crossed out Overture and wrote Introduction. I don't know if yeah. you can see that, because, yeah. frankly, oh. it's it's an introduction. You don't need to... Mm -mm. So, here we go. <laughs> so, first, what we're going to talk about <laughs> is... Who is Jordan Peterson targeting this book to? Yeah. Again, this is going to happen a lot in this book. Um, Jordan Peterson does a good job of partitioning and keeping apart any ideas that if he put them too close to each other would make him look bad. Does that make sense? It does. He he has idea apartheid going on where he, he only puts his worst <laughs> ideas one at a time in one section or another. So we're certainly going to pull from this book, but also some articles and stuff. Um... Basically talking about who is Jordan Peterson talking to when he's talking to the reader of this book. Yeah, and and so uh, very early on, um, the first thing he talks about in this book, we mentioned it briefly in the video uh, prior, is he talks about uh, Quora, um, the online uh, basically question and answer forum, uh, in which he, he was very happy with getting a, quote, 99 percentile positive answer on Quora, which is basically the the proto version of what we're reading in this book. It was like, okay, what are some uh, facets of life that one should cling to? And, you know, some of them, he says, are tongue-in-cheek, some of them are whatever. Um, this is kind of like a little window into his personality. He plays the humble guy. He constantly says, I don't want the spotlight, but I'm burdened with it. Therefore, I, I ought to... Deal with it. Uh, this, Jordan Peterson, and, and this isn't a bad thing, for the record. This is just an observation. Um, I don't think he minds the limelight whatsoever. And, in fact, I think he, he relishes it uh, quite a bit. Um, but it's important for him to say that he he doesn't. He's he's the... he's he's. It almost martyrs himself, in a way, when he is the one up on, up on the milk, the, the soap crate... When he has to, when he has to go out there and and for the common folk, for the common man with a capital M, uh, say things that you know, otherwise uh, less intelligent folks, air quotes, uh, wouldn't be able to get across quite in the way that he can. Here's a little taste of his his humble being. So speaking about the list that this book is actually based on, he says, The Quora readers appeared pleased with this list. They commented on and shared it. They said such things as, I'm definitely printing this list out and keeping it as a reference. Simply phenomenal! And you win Quora. We can just close the site now. Students at the University of Toronto, where I teach, came up to me and told me how much they liked it. To date, my answer to, what are the most valuable things, has been viewed by 120,000 people and been upvoted 2,300 times. Only a few hundred of the roughly 6,000 questions on Quora have cracked the 2,000 upvote barrier. My procrastination-induced musings hit a nerve. I had written a 99.9 .9 percentile answer, which yeah. is the quote you were talking about now, earlier. Now, 
This does a couple things. Uh, first, it illuminates the point I was making, that I'm pretty sure he really enjoys the limelight. Nobody hates being agreed with, especially someone who thinks they're as profound as Jordan Peterson. Um, like, I can't imagine that you liking this video would make me uncomfortable. Does that make sense? Yeah. I enjoy that. We enjoy validation. There's nothing wrong with enjoying validation, inherently. Sure. Um, the other thing this does is it tells the reader of this book who's reading it now... Other people like this, it's okay to like this. This is smart marketing. This is good, because what he's about to say in this book should be, to our audience, wildly unpopular. But apparently it isn't. He has some good ideas, I hear. He may be wrong sometimes, but he's right other times. But is he, though, audience? I don't think so. He goes on to talk about the concept of chaos. We're skipping forward, but we'll back up when we talk about the uh, other topics here. Um, he begins to talk about chaos because, of course, this these 12 rules are indeed the antidote to chaos. Um, and how he describes chaos is very interesting. Chaos to him is uh, in the form, because, of course, he deals with uh, ancient texts a lot of the time, uh, most of which the Bible, um... He describes um, order as masculine. He describes chaos as feminine. And now, at, uh, at first glance, you could say oh, that's not a big deal because, sure, some ancient cultures absolutely do do that. Yeah. I think that's fine. That's fair. But the subtext here, because of who Jordan Peterson is, because of the content of his words outside of the beginning of this book and deeper into the body of this book, this is geared toward... Anti-social justice, anti-feminist uh, young white guys. Mostly young white guys. Doesn't have to be. Um, but just if you take the anti-SJW and anti-feminist crowd, that's immediately who he's, who he's going for. And that's why that's in the book. Like, that's why immediately the first one of the first things he says is, by the way, it's okay to like this book. Next of all, femininity is inherently chaotic. And, and that's that's an issue not because <laughs> it, it doesn't seem like an issue, I guess, based on the way it's written, right? Sure. I can see how someone who isn't thinking about this um, would go into this thinking, okay, that's just a historical reference, that's fine. But he continues to expand on it. And if you, in fact, take context from other sources from Jordan Peterson himself, just outside of this book, it becomes very clear who this is for and what his intention is. Here's what he has to say on chaos and femininity. The state of order is typically portrayed symbolically, imaginatively, as masculine. It's the wise king and the tyrant, forever bound together as society is simultaneously structure and oppression. What I find interesting about this is that he considers even when he's talking about mythology, when he's talking about sort of these mythic ideals, which we're going to get into later, um... He describes and his description inherently and his examples sort of tip a hand to his weird focus on masculine being yeah. ordered. He considers, a, he talks about wise king and a tyrant, two sides of what I assume he would consider the same coin. But he doesn't consider tyranny inherently chaotic, despite the fact that certainly you could make a case for that Sure. somewhere. I mean, you could say it's some sort of authoritarian legalism but even then yeah. i feel like by describing it in such a way it's already showing that he certainly already has a preconception that he's going to put things into those boxes for regardless of right. whether or not it is a black and white issue and of course it's presuppositionalists uh, inherently sure. to put forth that um either masculinity or femininity is one facet he could have he could have reversed those and it would still be false sure. because of the inherent just like non-conformity, non-homogeneity of those two facets of human beings? Sure. Those those don't necessarily denote any part of your personality whatsoever. They just happen to be part of who you are, socially speaking. Sure. He goes on to say, Chaos is what emerges more catastrophically when you suddenly find yourself without employment or are betrayed by a lover. He'll mention this more than once. I think JBP's been cheated on. Again, not a great feeling. It, no, it's not, and he's not wrong. But again, it's such an odd thing that he brings up twice. Like a in the in the introduction, he brings it up twice. Again, <laughs> leading me to believe, and I think this is founded by uh, evidence based on the rest of the book and his other speeches 
and uh, his fan base in general, and the way he talks about feminists in general, is it's throwing women under the bus on purpose... To make young men feel better about their lack of interaction with the opposite gender. Now, I know what you're going to say, Jordan Peterson fan. Man, men men can also cheat on, on women, and sure. women can identify with that passage. Absolutely. But he's... If, if you're going to argue with me, he's not he's not aiming this at a particular um, penile version of humans. Uh, then, then we're not reading the same book. He continues... As the antithesis of symbolically masculine order, it's presented imaginatively as feminine. It's the new and unpredictable suddenly emerging into the midst of the commonplace familiar. It's creation and destruction, the source of new things, and the destination of the dead. Okay. He goes on also. In the recent New York Times article that was pretty popular on Twitter, you can find it. Just Google New York Times Jordan Peterson. Yeah. He expands upon this by saying, you know, you can say, well, isn't it unfortunate that chaos is represented by the feminine? Well, it might be unfortunate, but it doesn't matter because that's how it's represented. Do you see what he does there? He gives himself an out. He says it is indeed unfortunate. It's unfortunate, but it's a fact. It's an unfortunate fact that femininity is not only shown to symbolically represent chaos, but that it also is chaos. It introduces chaos into the world, um, which to me, that's the gayest shit I've ever heard. He also says, (laughs) the left, he believes, refuses to admit that men might be in charge because they're better at it. The people who hold that our culture is an oppressive patriarchy, they don't want to admit that the current hierarchy might be predicated on competence, he said. And again, this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about his his separation of his bad ideas far enough apart that hopefully you can't put them together and come to his actual conclusion that he's coming to unless you read a lot of his stuff and put it together as a fan of his. Watch a lot of his... uh his talks, a lot of his debates, a lot of his interviews. So you see right there, if, if we go from the book, which came before this interview, yeah. uh, the book starts out with the concept that femininity and masculinity are diametrically opposed. One is order, one is chaos. Um, but now you're getting to the part where he's just kind of coming out and saying it, that men are just better at leading the world. Yeah. They provide order. Women are too chaotic. He'll also say something to the effect of uh, women find more agreeable jobs and stuff like nursing and caretaking because they're really good at that stuff, whereas men are more more apt to be, you know, leaders in the workplace. Um, I also Jordan Peterson is ignoring is ignoring society as a whole in regards to this. It also shocks me that he considers nursing an agreeable position. Has he met a nurse in his life? Yeah, nurses are fucking uh also men as well. <laughs> and I don't want to say that like he 100% is saying that women shouldn't have no. leadership positions in uh corporate America and the private sector whatever. Uh, or, well, I guess in his case, uh, North America, so Canada. Sure. But he begs, his fan base... He begs the question a lot. That's oh, his problem. Oh, that's his thing. He brings up points and he, he alludes and dances around the yes. subject to the point that it becomes obvious to anyone who isn't being intentionally obtuse what he's getting at. Yeah. And that's why he has such a huge incel uh, follower base. And I'm not saying that's even the majority of his fans. I don't think it is. I think they're the extreme version of it. But, I mean... This, like, is, the, when this is the last quote I'll read from the article for this episode. But this one goes a long way to explaining the mentality of some of his fan base, let's say. It made sense in a primordial way when he breaks down Adam and Eve, the snake and chaos, Mr. Arar says. Eve made Adam self-conscious. Women make men self-conscious because they're the ultimate judge. I was like... Wow, this is really true, end quote. That's a fan? That's a fan. That's, yeah. someone, someone That's a fan is... quoting Jordan Peterson and then himself being quoted. If you consider women to be the ultimate judge of you, or any one group of people that makes up 50-something percent of the population, yeah. if you consider an entire group of people the ultimate judge of you, they are not 
you have self-image problems, and this is something Jordan Peterson will not help you address. If anything, he's gonna dig you into a trench so deep you're gonna be, your room's gonna be full of just pee bottles and Mountain Dew. But very organized because you cleaned your room, They'll be very organized pee bottles, but it's not a good place to go. (laughs) Just mall swords and pee bottles. See, what he does, though, to get his very conservative viewpoints across to people is he frames the opposition, the left, as the most extreme versions of the concept of leftism. Yeah. So he'll always say that, like, for instance, he used he used uh, the term the patriarchy earlier, where we are in a, a society where uh, the, a patriarchal structure was left behind for us, and I think our generation, and maybe even the generation right before us, is doing a pretty good job where we don't really consider it very much, and but of course there's still lattice work, and the same thing is true of uh, uh, African Americans in the country where there's still black neighborhoods, and it was be- due to segregation, but it's also because like people own those homes now, now there's 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 black neighborhoods, and it's kind of a left, it's a remnant of that time where we don't have segregation anymore. There's now con- it's just sort of an accidental societal imp- like it's, structure. It's de facto yes. the cultural and socioeconomic ramifications of the things that are still echoing today despite the fact that in exactly. the law, it has been corrected. Correct. So, when when far-left people are like, the patriarchy, sometimes it's true. Sometimes there is that structure. Other times, it's definitely not the case. And so, when when he attacks... Uh, attacks is probably a strong word. When he heavily implies that you ought to feel a certain way about that mindset, and then counters with what seems to be reasonable because it's so disparate and far apart from itself, uh, it it makes you go, oh, oh, so so Jordan Peterson's reasonable. So conservatism is reasonable. Puts on MAGA hat. He also shits on 1950s housewives in there. We'll get to that at some point, but oh boy. So as we promised, uh, as a channel that uh, largely deals in the religious and religious books, um, maybe you've heard of The Atheist Bible Study. It's a thing we do. Oh, I wasn't aware. Yeah. So uh, this book is indeed uh, very very heavily steeped in religion. And a lot of Jordan Peterson fans uh, in our previous video, like, like cringed at that because they didn't believe that to be the case they didn't think that this book indeed the one that you have colored in at least as much as your copy of the bible uh doesn't have this religious iconography however if you read the foreword which is not jordan peterson's the first thing that pops up is an allegory about moses and and the sacred golden calf um and how you know rules were meant to shrug off rules um humans natural uh, instinct when met with rules is to not follow them, yeah. um, which maybe I can agree with, but I also don't totally agree with that. And he'll go on to expand on that thought by saying a phrase that he will say in in this book um, uh, just so many times, and that is the great stories of the past. A phrase that is just a very thin veil over saying biblical Christianity. Uh, and now he'll go on to uh, cite some other sources like, oh, I read uh, other old books and other, uh, you know, uh, indigenous stuff in uh, Roman, and, but mostly the Bible. And <laughs> it's shocking to me that you as a reader, if you are indeed a Jordan Peterson fan and an atheist, don't immediately cringe at that because it, I'm, as, I'm assuming most of his fans, if they are atheists, are apostates. Sure. Because what this does is it takes something very familiar to you, a list of core tenets, and it says, I'm not religious, but boy, doesn't it feel comfortable to read this book and have something laid out for you? And also, it does this thing where he says you take responsibility for your actions, stand up straight, clean your room, speak with intent. Yeah. But every time one of those things comes up, femininity is the problem. Or chaos is the problem. Chaos is the problem, which is femininity. Sure. Uh, Lack of societal cohesion, as he goes down to talk about. Which is chaos, which is femininity. Yeah. 
low place in social structure due to feminine <laughs> rejection, which he gets into in the first chapter. So what I'm saying is, he's not actually telling you to do anything other than blame others? I don't, I don't really know. He continues to <laughs> say, if people really noticed what I was teaching, there'd be hell to pay. What bugs me the most about that is that there is a literal emoticon at the end of that sentence, which yes. I have never seen in a published work before. I'm sure it's happened. I'm not, I don't need you in the comments to point to me the 70 books before this that have had an emoticon in the text. Don't do that. Not cool, man. After that section, he'll talk about uh, the research he put into uh, Mirrors of Meaning, um, which was the book that came before this, which he constantly says is just a very dense book. It's got so much information. Again, it's very much like the Quora section of this book, where every time he mentions Mirrors of Meaning, it has to be this sort of like insurmountable intellectual jargon that the normal man can't wrap their head around so he wrote this book to help you that mirrors of meaning is for jordan for people of his ilk he's a level three debater i think it's also a little more overtly religious than this book oh which... really you wouldn't say quote large research time spent on large sections of the bible milton's paradise lost uh, Gouda's, uh, Faust, and Dante's Inferno. Now, if you don't know, uh, we're gonna have a- here's- here's a little introductory period, uh, uh, on those things. So, Milton's Paradise Lost is about Adam and Eve over the course of about 12 books of an epic poem. It's extremely dense, extremely long, and basically the thesis of that whole thing is to justify the ways of God to men. That is actually the thesis of the book, uh, of book one, written by Milton himself. In, in Gouda's Faust, uh, it's based on an actual man, uh, I think it's Johann Faust, um, he was a, uh, a erudite, he was a person that uh, had a lot of uh, knowledge, uh, a lot of uh, history and science and all that, and uh, over the um, course of the book, uh, basically it shows that he is more geared towards the human knowledge than the divine, and as such is damned. In Dante's epic poem Inferno, which is about Dante being guided through the nine circles of hell by Virgil, the ancient Roman poet, the first of the three books of the divine comedy uh, Purgatorio and Paradiso, uh, following after, um, it's basically about um, the soul's, the, the actual physical soul's journey um, through the afterlife and, and eventually getting placed uh, where it ought to be. And... Um, also showing show, showing the uh, the uh, uh, when the bill comes due basically from your life. Also, lots of concurrent Florentinian politics were involved in that. Book. That's true. Yes, I've, I've read it. A lot of that has footnotes. It's where not it's a... like so. You understand this reference? This is what was going on in the area yeah. at the time. This is who he's making fun of. Yeah. So um, <laughs> the. He doesn't write out any books specifically that he read. He writes these, which are Christian fiction, but they're also heavily steeped in theology. And, like, if you've heard of, like, the fallen angel Satan before, it's because of these books, not because of the Bible. And it, it, just, it, it just informs where Jordan Peterson is coming from and kind of his worldview. He may not be a overtly Christian. He may not even be... Christian Christian in the way that, like, a Christian would like one to be. Sure. He's Christian in that, like, oh, we go to church on Christmas, Christian. We go to life church. You know what I mean? Like, when I raise my kids, we're going to go to a, a non-denominational, we have barbecues. You know, we're just like everyone else, but also, here's the rules to live your fucking life. See, here, I think it's actually more insidious than that. I think it's even worse, because I think he's a worse brand of Christian than that. Because I think most people who do the non-denominational <laughs> thing, at the very least, at the end of the day, they still think what they believe is somehow objectively real. I get the sense that most Christians, <clears throat> at the very least, believe in some sort of objective reality and okay. that God has a place within it. Okay, we're going to get to that conversation. And and I want you to hold on to that thought because we're not quite done with steeped religion. I know. How, however, it is very important to realize that Jordan Peterson pretty overtly does not believe in the same reality that you and I probably believe in um, as naturalists. 
typically when you're an atheist. So, continuing on. He goes on to say, and this is a quote, The West moves further from religion, and out of this comes desperation and meaningless. I don't know how to make an argument for that not being religious. <laughs> he then goes on to use an example of himself having a fever dream of sorts, uh, where uh, he will hang from a chandelier in a cathedral, and he will... He will <laughs> Again, I, I told you, he kind of martyrs himself a lot. Uh, he literally does that in this dream sequence where he's in the middle of a church. And based on my knowledge of cathedrals, they are shaped like crosses. And as such, I was at the center of that cross, which is the center of suffering. And he... <laughs> he goes on to basically have this Paul-like dream... And then he espouses it to you guys, and you ate it up. I don't understand it. Did you not watch enough of Hugo and Jake? PewDiePie said he didn't. He read the whole book and didn't realize Jordan Peterson was even religious. And the only thing that makes sense to me in that is we're looking through an American lens where we're very, very religious um, statistically, and he's he's from Sweden, and that's not the case. So he might not catch that immediately. Also, he's fucking PewDiePie. He's not exactly an intellectual juggernaut, not to say that we are, but like the expectation there for PewDiePie to review a book critically is not very high for me. I suppose. Why is PewDiePie doing book reviews anyway? I don't know. I think he just liked the book. I have no fucking clue. That eh, makes a lot of sense. He goes on to say, um, and, and this is the thing I, ha I, I have a little bit of uh, umbrage with based on his... Um, the way he goes at Sam Harris, which I don't totally agree with either, but he uses the word suffering. And he says, we need to find meaning in individual consciousness, and in this manner we can reduce suffering. This will go to your point in a minute. But he doesn't define suffering, which is a thing he has a problem with Sam Harris about. It feels to me very hypocritical of him to, say, to even use the word the phrase, reduce suffering as a catch-all for, for, for wellness. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. Just based on his other debates, specifically the one that Dylan Hunty is the most recent one I can think of where he, he mentions this. Because yeah. he, for the last, like, 17 fucking weeks, he's been saying, like, Oh, I just finished the, uh, uh, all of uh, his books, and uh, I just don't think he, he doesn't go for the heavy hitters. You know what I mean? And he, he constantly brings up the fact that he doesn't approach the word suffering correctly or wellness or well-being. Sure. Yeah. Irritates me. And um, the last two quotes uh, that I thought were really striking as far as the religious iconography is concerned is, we require routine and tradition. Specifically, the tradition part sticks out to me because what's our tradition in North America? Christianity, generally Protestantism. Protestant Christianity, yes. Yeah. Correct. Like, I think, I think, other than that, he's not talking about indigenous people. He's mm, certainly not talking about uh, being under British control and serving a monarchy. No. Nah. Our tradition here in North America, and again, this is, this is in between verses where he's constantly referencing religious texts. Yeah. It's religion. And then finally, the soul of the individual eternally hungers for the heroism, heroism of genuine being. Willingness to take that responsibility on is identical to lead a meaningful life. But what does he mean by meaningful life? What does he mean by being? Okay, this is a section that I'm probably going to talk the most about out of this whole video, and that's because it honestly befuddles me that anyone can read this book, read what Jordan Peterson has said yes. about objective reality, and not believe that everything he said afterwards is basically moot. Because none of his opinions should matter, because it does not appear that this is a person who believes in objective reality. I'm going to build a case here based on the quotes in this introduction that Jordan Peterson believes that truth equals societal consensus, and that's as close to objective reality as you should ever hope to strive for. 
He begins the book by saying, In 2012, I started contributing to a site called Quora. Of course, we talked about this earlier. Quora, anyone can ask a question of any sort, and anyone can answer. Readers upvote the answers they like and downvote those they don't. In this manner, the most useful answers rise to the top while the others sink into oblivion. Pretty innocuous. It's just describing how Quora works. But... That compounded along earlier with what we were saying about how much he likes to talk about how popular his answers are. Correct. It builds upon this case that Jordan Peterson seems to think that truth equals a group consensus. And so, I know on its own that's not a lot. So, of it. well, that, that leads to some problems, especially if, of course, you are an atheist watching this. Um, you would probably not agree that consensus equals truth in things that regard, say, I don't know, Jesus being divine? Because in that case, Jesus would in fact be divine. Sure. Because the consensus in America, and I know that that's, that's slowly dropping, yeah. uh, we would be wrong. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're wrong. Sure. But that goes directly in opposition to how Jordan Peterson feels reality exists. Sure. He's talking about, uh, in mythology, he goes on to say, I proposed in Maps of Meaning that the great myths and religious stories of the past, particularly those derived from an earlier oral tradition, were moral in their intent rather than descriptive. Thus, they did not concern themselves with what the world was, as scientists might have it, but with how much a human being should act. I suggested that our ancestors portrayed the world as a stage, a drama instead of a place of objects. I described how I had come to believe that the constituent elements of the world as a drama were order and chaos and not material things. Again, this compounds earlier with the order and chaos being masculine and feminine, respectively. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's pretty nicely tucked in next to uh, vocab words that maybe a, a quick read-through wouldn't wouldn't make that clear i guess but once yeah. you sit with that paragraph I, just read it over twice really yeah. like actually read it and synthesize it in your head he's very clearly saying saying that materialism the nat naturalism things existing isn't how he views the world he views the world as a set of experiences only this is so close to like I think, therefore, I am. Like, very, very early, early, like, how we deal with reality. Sure. Stuff. Like, this is, this is, like, baseline where we start that thinking process. You know what I mean? Like, Socrates was thinking about this kind of shit. Even, like, terrible philosophies like Ayn Rand objectivism, at the very least, do sort of try and address the difference between perceived reality and and reality it disregards that but it still addresses it in its disregarding of that in its view that you can derive objective reality from reason and I, inductive reasoning yeah i think i think maybe uh a little a little more structure to those we should probably explain exactly what what ayn rand uh and kind of like where jordan peterson lies between that Ayn Rand sort of version of reality and where most of us usually exist. Okay, philosophically, Ayn Rand objectivism, if I can try and mm, truncate this in the best way I possibly can. Essentially, the idea is that there is an objective reality, objectivism, and you can derive the truth of objective reality using your senses and reason to get there. Now that on its face value seems like, of course, you can use it seems your, reasonable. It seems like something we would actually agree with. You can use your reason to understand objective reality. But what happens when you and I disagree? Right. And it also has to do with the difference between some sort of inductive reasoning or reasoning with data sets, for instance. Correct. This is why a Republican might say who Republicanism and modern conservatism, a lot of it, philosophically closely resembles Ayn Rand objectivism Correct. in the sense that they might say, it's snowing outside today, global warming isn't true. Does that make sense? Yes. It's not using data and trying to get some sort of, even system like science. Science seems on its surface like a way to look at objective reality. Really, science doesn't concern itself necessarily with what is objective reality. It concerns itself with providing as much data to ourselves as possible so we can make predictions about the future that are as accurate as possible and it's open to change over time objectivism isn't that it is i can know objective reality using my reason period yeah and i think jordan peterson would disagree with that because 
he disagrees with how consciousness even is. Yeah. So he disagrees with how we perceive the world. He doesn't think that consciousness is tied to the brain. He thinks... And if he... The way he thinks it's tied to the brain is very, very tangentially. Those are his words. Uh, not mine. Uh, so... Implying that if you were to remove the brain and smash it like fucking Gallagher with a watermelon mallet, I would exist exterior from that. Like, well, I, I would I would be... I would be somewhere with a capital B. I would be elsewhere. That again plays into the idea that he's a theist, though, which I, I think agree. is very That's much... That's where I was headed. This, because he, dualism is in, not inherently religious, but if you're religious and believe in the idea of a soul, you yeah. are a dualist. That's what that is. At best, he's a deist. Yeah. At best. And now, I'm not... <laughs> Someone's going to say in the in the con- the founding fathers were deists. Yeah, they had slaves and syphilis. Like they're not great. Some of them were really good at lawmaking. Like I think we can stop sucking dick a little bit, huh? I talked to you about this the other day. I'm pretty sure Ben Franklin figured out bifocals when he was fucking a butterface. He was like, I yeah. don't want to see up here very clearly, but the rest, yeah. Whoever bifocals. Fergie was back in the day. Yeah. Let's talk about Jordan Peterson and the definition of capital B being, because this is something that is going to come into con. <laughs> this is something we're going to talk about a lot in this book, yeah. probably, and this directly ties into his view of what constitutes reality. Yes. Because we are vulnerable and mortal, pain and anxiety are integral part of the human existence. We must have something to set against the suffering that is intrinsic to being. And then there's an asterisk, and then there is a whole section that literally just defines being, and I'm going to read the whole thing. I use the term being with a capital B in part because of my exposure to the idea of the 20th century German philosopher Martin Heidegger. Heidegger tried to distinguish between reality, as conceived objectively, and the totality of human experience, which is, quote, being. Being with a capital B is what each of us experiences subjectively, personally, and individually, as well as what we each experience jointly with others. As such, it includes emotions, drives, dreams, visions, and revelations, as well as our private thoughts and experiences, Being is also, finally, something that is brought into existence by action. So its nature is, to an indeterminate degree, a consequence of our decisions and choices, something shaped by our hypothetically free will. Construed in this manner, being is, one, not something easily and directly reducible to material and objective, and two, something that most definitely requires its own term, as Heidegger labeled for decades to indicate. So this definition of being that he's working with essentially boils down to some sort of mixture of of your own subjective experiences and when he goes into mythology and the ideas of these sort of general societal consensuses almost a a, a hume-esque like <laughs> collective unconscious where yeah. the what makes up being and reality is constituted of your subjective experience and society's views of reality not reality itself does that make sense reality is what you experience And what society communally agrees upon as truth. Jesus is real. Yeah. So, at this point, we have established that he doesn't necessarily believe in objective reality. He believes in some sort of group-based consensus. Now, why does he consider something like this so important? Uh, He goes on to say... For better or worse, trying to address a perplexing problem. The reason or reasons for the nuclear standoff in Cold War I... He calls it Cold War I, by the way. I couldn't understand how belief systems could be so important to people that were willing to risk the destruction of the world to protect them. I came to realize that shared belief systems made people intelligible to one another and that the systems weren't just about belief. People who live by the same code are rendered mutually predictable to one another. They act in keeping with each other's expectations and desires. They can cooperate. They can even compete peacefully because everyone knows what to expect from everyone else. A shared belief system, partially psychological, partly acted out, simplifies everyone in their own eyes and in the eyes of others. Shared beliefs simplify the world as well, because people know what to expect from one another can act together to tame the world. There is perhaps nothing more important than the maintenance of this organization, <laughs> and this, if it's threatened, the great ship of state rocks. Okay, so what this is, very subtly, 
to someone who read it real quick once, but not so subtly if you read it more than once, is uh, you ever hear that argument that, um, you, you know, like uh, uh, a state atheism in the Soviet Union led to death? Oh, he talks about that specifically. I know he does. He says, I read... He's, he does it over here, though. You see how he had to flip pages? I read more than my share of dark books about the 20th century, focusing Correct. particularly on Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. Right, but then you had to go, what is that, one, two, three, four pages later, yeah. he begins to finish that thought, <laughs> and he he says, oh, we all have to, we all have to rally around one idea so that we have, we're homogenous as a society, right. because, and I agree with him in part... A homogenous society tends to be more uh, capable of of uh, cooperation. Sure. I think that's obvious and reasonable. Sure. But the problem here is the thing that he wants us to rally around isn't the 12 rules book. It's, it's this cultural Christianity and his view of reality. Does that make sense? It's, it's, it, honestly, it's... Like, it's like he looked at, okay, it's like he looked at postmodernism, and I'm not the And first... he did look at postmodernism quite looked, a bit. He looked at postmodernism. Explain postmodernism, real quick. Uh, okay, first I gotta explain modernism. Modernism <laughs> was the idea, a uh, very prolific philosophical mindset in a variety of <sighs> different art forms and industries and the world as a whole that essentially... We could together, this is very much Reagan's shining city on a hill idea, yeah. it's the idea that we can all come together with an idea of a mutual goal and collectively create almost some sort of utopia. There was some sort of ideal future that we could strive towards and all work towards that would improve everything for everyone. Uh, do you remember the the Disney uh, self-sustaining city in a dome? Yeah. It's kind of like that. Very modernism. Um, when you see 1950s videos where it shows, like, housewives in the future, like, yeah, using... Yeah, like, robot, like, think Fallout's ID, like, without the bombs. <laughs> sure. Um, postmodernism was the ideal ideology that was birthed as a reaction to that, which we're sort of still, I would argue we're probably in the post-end of what would be considered postmodernist yeah. ideology because it's sort of coming to the end of its usefulness. We need to come up with something better at this point. It's the idea that we are recognizing as a society what is a shining city on a hill for me might be a dystopia for you. Right. So as a society, we cannot come together and necessarily come to this consensus of what the perfect ideal is because that ideal is different for everyone. And in a society, we need to make compromises and work together to try and come up with what is ideal for the most people and try and not trample on others. It's, it's the revelation yeah. that subjective experience... And different people come from different viewpoints, and that's okay, and we need to figure out what to do with that. Now, the problem there that you're seeing, politically speaking, yeah. is those that are still latching on to modernism, and but they don't know, they don't think they know it. But like uh, stark libertarians, yeah, uh, really hardcore socialists or communists, really hardcore authoritarians on either side of the fence. Sure. Uh, that's where you get this sort of. Uh, uh, I think that's the most most obvious usage of modernism today specifically libertarians because they're all so like the shining city on a hill can be the whole country if all of us have our own shining cities because we're libertarian and and if we just let the free market of society rule we all get that but that ties back into ayn rand objectivism too, i know it though, does because did i talk about the morality of ayn rand objectivism no okay ayn rand objectivism um morally speaking the moral philosophy there is that which is beneficial to an individual's um, well being, sta well -being uh, an undefined well being, sure. though, of course, uh, is positive morally, and that which is detrimental to one's own well being is morally negative. This is an inherently, yeah. and it's talking specifically about oneself, not any individual. Right. It's specifically an ideology. Um, read Atlas Shrugged if you want to see examples of this. It's why libertarians love that shit, sure. by the way. It's about. I'm going to do the best for me as I can and not worry about other people. It's basically saying selfishness is morality because if everyone behaves in a selfish way, everyone will be taken care of. That's a ridiculous statement. It right. doesn't make any sense. It implies sense. everyone has... Uh... 
not only the the same standards to which everyone should receive benefits or or not benefits but like um the fruits of the the earth let's just say that let's say there's an apple tree it implies everyone agrees that they all get one apple a day and no one says they want two apples a day sure right um and it also implies <laughs> that all we need is an apple a day yeah. Or whatever. And this this ties into Jordan Peterson's thing, too, because one of the things he talks about uh, later is all about what you should do is you should treat yourself yes. l- as if you were a person you were responsible for taking care of because you are. He's inherently, he's taking the golden rule, basically, do unto others as you would do unto who yourself. Who said that? Who said? <laughs> who said the golden rule? The golden rule? Yeah, who said that? Is it in the... Do unto others? I don't know. As you... I don't know who said that. That was... I I don't know. It's It's just an axiom. 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 Sorry. (laughs) Anyway, uh, he is essentially taking the golden rule and reversing it. Instead of saying, do unto others as you would do unto yourself, he's saying, do unto yourself as you would do unto others. Which is a weird view for someone who is so into Christian mythology to the point where he believes that if you believe it hard enough, it constitutes effective reality, at the very least, pragmatically speaking, if not in objective reality. This yeah. dude's weird. And then, of course, he said willingness to take that responsibility on is identical to leading a meaningful life. Sure. Because meaning, in his view, is literally... The sel- the selfish ideals of uh, of an Ayn Randian philosophy. I mean, it, it's pretty it's pretty obvious to me. I just I mean, I've read it twice. Just the introduction. I just I just sat down and read that thing twice. And and that's not the only thing I've read. That's so before you start typing, Peterson fan. Uh, it's just it's the first read through. It's easy to skim because because he uses long words and there's lots of there's lots of dancing around topics. Yeah. So it, it's. While it's a, it's not hard to read. It's hard to read every word. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Your mind wants to wants to fast forward because you already know where it's headed. You think, yeah. But because it's so, again, it's structured so disparately. And I don't know because Jordan Peterson talks like this as well. Yeah. I don't know if it's a side effect of how he thinks, or in an intentional way. Maybe that he does it. It might be both. Um, I, I'm sure in the book it's both. <laughs> uh, I don't know about when he talks. He's probably he's repeat. If you listen to a lot of his speeches and his uh, classes and shit, even his Patreon videos, um, you you you, <laughs> you hear him repeat shit a lot. So at this point, they're kind of just lines he says during his presentation. Uh, and so this, I think, this is probably one of the first. This is the final draft of the first draft of those lines. <laughs> All right, and then one of the most ominous closing lines i think of an introduction if we each live properly we will collectively flourish best wishes to all as you proceed through these pages dr jordan b movie peterson if we each live properly which is yet to be defined but of course the rest of the book is to define properly uh we will collectively be okay so next time uh as we read chapter one of jordan b peterson's book 12 rules for life stand up straight with your shoulders back is the name of the first chapter but it should be called you're a fucking lobster by jordan peterson yeah so you'll see that next time that one's gonna be i I don't know how long these videos are gonna be but we're gonna do them until we're satisfied with uh how many pages is this first chapter third 28 28 pages yeah that's not terrible. No. We can do that. A lot of it's just talking about lobster biology, which I can't believe I have to fucking research whether or not his statements on lobster biology are correct. But here we are. Anyway, so uh, if you like this video, give it a like and give it a share to somebody you think is a Jordan Peterson fan that ought not be. If you are a Jordan Peterson fan, please stick around because I think I think you could stand to learn a little bit because... Uh, you, you know, you might be an intelligent individual. Jordan Peterson might be an intelligent individual, but God damn it, he he he's being a charlatan. People like Ben Carson and Jordan B. Peterson very much fly in the face ben of the idea. Carson. The idea of generalized I intelligence, remember, the idea that him. there is some sort of intelligence quotient that everyone has. You know what, Ben Carson? If I need a neurosurgery, fuck yeah, Ben Carson, you cut my brain open the best you can. 
Maybe Jordan Peterson's smart at certain things. He's certainly smart at tricking young men into thinking he has important things to say. Yeah. Uh, not that great at adopting any sort of philosophy that no. gels with actual reality as far as we can see it. Or even admitting that such a thing exists. And again, I just want to reiterate one more time. Consider, as an atheist, I assume. Uh, if you're not, then this probably doesn't apply to you. As an atheist, though, consider why this resonates with you. Especially if you're an apostate. Especially if you're formerly religious. Because the way this reads is very sermon-like to me. I'm not an apostate, so this doesn't get me. Uh, you, on the other hand, are, and I think you realize very much... That's why it makes me mad, is because yeah. I can see what he's doing. Because you got worked up. Because I've been talking to you about Jordan Peterson on and off for probably three months. Yeah. And then we sat down and we watched the Dillahunty thing. And it finally, it clicked for you and you went home, you ordered the book, and I got angry voice messages on WhatsApp from this man. This doesn't happen very often. He's a passionate guy, but not an angry guy. He was angry, so I like it. You should stop taking advantage of people who, I are, agree. who are probably in a rough place in their life. Predisposed to latch on to things that are simple and easy to digest, such as 12 rules, such as, you know, maybe a commandment or two. Um, and also, uh, scapegoating. It's definitely scapegoating. And I know, as a Jordan Peterson fan, you don't want me to say that. I know that you're kind of upset at me for, you know, you're really upset at me and Hugo for even approaching this subject in a negative way. And if it helped you, it helped you. That's great. But I don't, I don't really think it has. What I think it's done is made you kind of an asshole to the people around you. You might feel better about yourself, but... You may notice, and this is probably not true of everybody, um, but there's been this thing going around, where because this is a very conservative book in general. It's also a religious book in general. You may notice that your otherwise non-conservative, non-religious friends not very happy with you right now. I've seen a lot of people, especially Jordan Peterson fans, going, um, you know, uh, even if they didn't vote for Trump, but I support Dave Rubin, or I like this, or I'm an anti-feminist. They don't like that I say these things. They're assholes. They just don't get it. It's a you thing. <laughs> Papa Jake and Uncle Hugo are here to try to help you out. This is our self-help book called Don't Take Advice from Idiots. Idiots. Anyway idiots but yeah we're yeah yes but we admit it so yeah. anyway that's what i'm saying you can always follow us on twitter at papa bird jake you can follow hugo at hugo reload you can also subscribe to the channel to make sure you get chapter two sent straight to your email inbox probably also chapter one since this was just the introduction oh yeah chapter one it feels like seven chapters <laughs> Jesus you can always uh, subscribe to this channel, click the bell if you want to make sure you get notifications sometimes. Do other stuff to make sure you get all the notifications, mm -hmm. though. I'm sure YouTube has a tutorial since it's very complicated for some reason to get videos you want to see. Discord.me slash Hugo and Jake is a great way to get uh, notifications straight to your phone because uh, we at everyone in the announcement section when we put out a new video, which only happens like twice a week, so... Yeah. Not super annoying. Um, also, you can uh, go to the Patreon and support the channel. Um, maybe one day we can uh, fly to uh, Jordan Peterson's house and he can weep in front of us while uh, he drinks tea or whatever. He, he probably drinks tea. He looks like a tea guy. I'd imagine he'll be crying when we open the door. It seems like he spends, based on his YouTube channel, a fair amount of his time just just weep, weeping, weeping openly. Weeping about the world. Which may, maybe we should weep more. Maybe that's our problem. Maybe if we wept a little bit more often, Jordan Peterson would make sense. No, he's a sociopath. He's just lying to people to make money. Oh, how dare you. Allegedly, lawyers. I'm not a lobster. I'm red, but I'm not a lobster. 